Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me today for the latest in our Global Mapper webcast series. Today's presentation, as you can see on the slide in front of you, is entitled Raster Processing in Global Mapper. We tend to focus a lot of our attention on working with vector data, so today we decided to give some attention to raster data, to working with raster data, very often uh, relegated to the role of a base map. Raster data does have a viable role to play in the broader field of geospatial data processing and geospatial analysis. So we're going to introduce some of the components, some of the elements of Global Mapper that allow you to work with raster data, that allow you to derive intelligence from your raster data files. Um, those of you who have been following our, our recorded broadcasts or have been following some of our live broadcasts uh, may recall those times when we had a, an open session for questions. Obviously, this is not an option with a recorded session. Um, there is no question and answer session in real time. But if you do have questions about any of the topics uh, that I cover, any of the issues that I raise, or just any questions in general, um, you can email us directly. Geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com is our contact email. I will put that in the description below. Uh, the YouTube uh, feed. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see that link right in there. Um, if you're watching this on our website, you can go to the menu at the top of the screen and go to support and find your way to our support site there. So there are communication options that are available to you. Um, I also want to plug the Global Mapper Forum. Uh, if you want to share some of your ideas or engage with some other users or ask questions, the Global Mapper Forum um, is an excellent venue for that. Um, I will provide links to uh, those sites, to the email and to the Global Mapper Forum uh, at the end of today's presentation. So for today, um, our primary focus, as I said, is going to be working with raster data. Um, specifically, we're going to introduce the basics of processing raster data in Global Mapper. We'll look at some of the configuration options, loading raster data, some of the settings you can apply, and maybe even introduce what exactly a raster layer is, how it differs perhaps from, from vector data you may be used to working with. Um, we will move into uh, some of the uh, more specific settings, things like adjusting transparency in a raster layer, uh, talking about the contrast adjustment, some of the uh, kind of fine tuning you can apply when you're working with uh, with raster data or imagery, imagery uh, data layers. Um, we'll talk about cropping, uh, the idea of physically reducing the size of uh, some imagery um, you know, to limit it to, to, to what you specifically require in a project area. And um, we'll also talk about the tiling process. You will find that when working with raster data, some of those files can get very large, very hard to manage. So we'll talk about tiling with ability to manage data in smaller sections. Um, and in a sense, the opposite of that will introduce the idea of mosaicing. Mosaicing is actually a very simple process in Global Mapper. Uh, if you bring in multiple files, and you run an export, um, whether that be in the same format or whether you want it to convert to a, convert it to a different format, Global Mapper will inherently mosaic those tiles together. So mosaicing is part of the normal workflow in Global Mapper. We want to talk about uh, some of the more advanced processing that can be applied in Global Mapper. Um, we'll specifically talk about rectification, the idea of being able to take a standard image file, um, a picture if you like, and um, use some ground control points to give that geographic intelligence to create a geo-referenced raster layer. That again can be exported uh, in any of our uh, supported formats and used in any other uh, uh, geospatial application. Um, we will transition a little bit um, to kind of introducing an element of vector data and that is the ability to derive vectors from a raster layer. Uh, this is perhaps one of the more um, hidden uh, functional components of Global Mapper, but at the same time, it is one of the more powerful tools. Um, some of you, I have, you know, I've talked to folks who've been using Global Mapper for quite some time, who when asked to find this function uh, are not even aware that it's there, not even aware that it's an option. So I'm going to uh, introduce you to the vectorization tool, as I like to describe it, the ability to derive vectors from a raster layer. Um, We'll also introduce the opposite, which is essentially rasterizing vectors, which is actually a, a simple process. If you want to export a raster file and you have vector features on your screen, lines, points, polygons, they will uh, be rasterized when, during the export process. There is an option when you export to, to include those vector features. So that is a fairly automated process. But we will address that in the context of this workflow going back and forward between raster and vector files. 
We will then talk about the raster calculator, introduced fairly recently, um, the ability to perform a numeric calculation against some raster data. Now, specifically in this scenario, we're going to conduct an NDVI, a naturalized difference vegetation index analysis. Essentially, what we're going to do is, is determine the relative greenness of an area, and that's going to be derived from multiband imagery. We're going to use some Landsat imagery and perform a calculation on the red band and the near-infrared band that um, are part of that data set uh, in order to gauge the relative greenness. We'll actually take that analysis a step further and do a seasonal comparison. We're kind of moving away from the, the fundamentals of raster processing, but to complete that workflow, we'll use some of our, our uh, uh, calculation formulas to conduct the, an analysis of the difference between those two seasons. So uh, again, to, to complete the workflow, we'll, we'll uh, do the entire process. And to wrap up today, we're going to give some recommendations in terms of best practices for batch processing or indeed for processing raster data in any way. Um, when we're dealing with raster files, they tend to be very large. Uh, per unit of geographic area, if you're rendering objects in a raster form, the file size when compared to working with the comparable, comparable coverage area with vector data is going to be a lot, lot larger. So you will want to employ some uh, efficiency mechanisms when it comes to processing processing raster data, whether it be converting, reprojecting, or just manage it with, managing that data within the context of, uh, of your working global mapper. So we'll introduce things like grouping data, um, batch processing. We have a batch processing uh, application within an application. And I will introduce a little bit of scripting. I'm not sure I'm going to have time actually to demonstrate uh, the creation of a script, but the fact that your raster data can be processed using a script. Um, if you are interested in more information on scripting, there is a dedicated uh, video that we have on our YouTube channel about building a script in Global Mapper. But it is a component of uh, the best practices, I guess, for processing raster data. So the first bullet, uh, introduction to raster data in Global Mapper. Uh, we're going to begin by introducing the basics and uh, essentially exploring the some of the components of Global Mapper that pertain specifically to working with imagery or working with raster layers. So the procedure for accessing raster data in Global Mapper is the same as any other files. Um, you have the button in the middle of the introductory screen to open your data. You can also go to the file menu. Drag and drop also works if you want to simply drag an imagery file or a raster file. Importing it into Global Mapper that way uh, is very simple as well. Um, I'm just going to import a sample of a JP2 file, which is a JPEG 2000 file, um, one of the more common file formats you may encounter. And this just happens to be our brand new office here. This is where we are right now. We just, in the last couple of months, moved to a new location. And this is a raster layer. This is a picture. This is a, an aerial image. Um, obviously, it's uh, uh, easy with, when using this image to discern visible features. We can see cars in the parking lot. We can see the building itself, and we can see vegetation over here to the right side of my image. Um, this was a file that I actually accessed from an online source. Um, I used a streaming service to access data, and I was able to capture that, save that locally. And one of the questions that we are often asked is, where do I get data? Where is the best location for me to find data? Well, certainly those online sources uh, are very useful, very valuable. They provide a lot of uh, high quality uh, data sets, including a lot of imagery such as you see now, uh, not only for the US, but also uh, worldwide. You can also access files. You can access uh, uh, imagery in file format. Uh, many uh, regional government, state government, provincial government agencies uh, will archive imagery and allow you to download that, maybe through some sort of interactive map where you can decide what areas you're interested in. They'll package up those files and allow you to download them. And some of the more common formats that you will encounter um, are um, include Mr. Sid. I'm just going to open up my list here so we can see some of the, the raster types. Uh, Mr. Sid is a common one if I scroll down to the M's. Um, Multi-resolution seamless imagery data, database I guess, uh, is a common imagery format. GeoTIFF is another one that is supported and is very commonly used. JPEG 2000 was the the format of the file that I imported. It's part of my personal preference. I like working with JP2 files. ECW is another format that's supported. So essentially all of the common formats that you're likely to encounter when you access data, when somebody sends you a file, or when you uh, download some data, Global Mapper can ingest those files. 
Also, as I mentioned, you can access data from a streaming service, access a raster data from a streaming service. If I open up our online data dialog box, the little globe here in the toolbar uh, at the top of my screen is the easiest way to access that function. You can see an entire section here. Um, if I collapse this window, you can see a section that allows us to access imagery. Um, and this obviously is just one element of, uh, of raster data, aerial image. We'll introduce some other examples of, of raster data in just a few minutes. Um, but off the bat here, as you can see, we've got some Landsat imagery. This is actually a redirect to the Earth Explorer site where you can download the files themselves. This is essentially, a, it's not a streaming service, but a data access service. But some of these, as you can see, are streaming services. We have the US uh, NAEP data, which is administered by the Department of Agriculture. Recently introduced to the Global Mapper setup is the US National Map data. And you can see as part of that package, we have one foot resolution data. In fact, the image you're seeing behind us dialog box was accessed using that service. We have a catch-all world imagery set as well. Uh, you can uh, download it, various resolutions depending on where you are in the world. But again, a streaming service allows you to render the data in real time. Um, other uh, raster data sets you'll find in here, we have a section on topographic maps. Uh, I will, as a, in a minute, uh, introduce some variations on the theme of raster data. But we can, we can obviously download uh, topographic maps. If you're in the US, the USGS quad maps are streamable. You can download and, uh, and again, uh, process the data. So uh, online streaming services are an excellent source for getting raster data. Now my last bullet, if you recall, when I introduced today's topic was best practices. I'm going to introduce one of those best practices now because it's appropriate in this context. If you are streaming data, if your intention is to access data from one of those online services, and I strongly encourage you to explore those as essentially your own personal data library embedded within Global Mapper. I would strongly encourage you uh, to download whatever area the, of interest that you happen to be working in or, or exploring. Uh, obviously, in my case, I initially streamed the imagery of uh, the new building here. And uh, after I had uh, found that and, and, and delineated the extent, I downloaded that file. So this is now a local file on my hard drive. The benefit is obviously I'm no, no longer dependent on the streaming service, my internet connection. Um, I can load up the file much more quickly. So that is a, a recommended best practice workflow when you're accessing data online is immediately initiate the capture of that data. And that process is initiated right from the file menu. You'll go to export and choose your raster image format for that process. Now, if you have a specific format that you're required to work with, and obviously you can choose it from this list. If you want a personal recommendation from me, I would suggest JPEG 2000 would be the one that it's a good combination of efficient compression and uh, quality of the data. And uh, the image you see behind obviously is a JPEG 2000 image. So access to data, whether it be in file format or whether it be streaming service, gives you an opportunity to integrate a lot of different uh, raster files into Global Mapper. Now let's take a look at some examples of raster data. As you can see, this is an aerial image. This is a, I believe, a 25 centimeter resolution aerial image. Now we can prove that, we can verify that by simply zooming in. Obviously at this level, it looks like a crisp photograph, but as you'll see as I zoom in, it becomes clear that this image, this apparent smooth image, is actually comprised of a series of what are called pixels. Each one of these pixels, as you can see, is a solid color. Uh, this one is a fairly defined green color. We have a, a lighter kind of beige color, I guess, or a grayish beige color here. Um, at this level, the data doesn't seem to be of any value. It's not really conveying anything useful. Um, you can see very quickly, if you look at my scale bar at the bottom of my screen, this is in meters, so this is 25 centimeters right here. We can verify that that is the resolution of this image. Every pixel is 25 centimeters apart. Now, does that mean that anything any feature that's smaller than that will not be visible? Well, not necessarily. If you have something that's smaller than that, that's a particular color, the aggregate color within each pixel will be determined by whatever, what the majority of that pixel encompasses. So even if you have something that's smaller, let's say you have a, a line feature that's narrower than 25 centimeters, chances are the influence of that color within that pixel will determine that it will actually be visible, maybe not in a crisp form, but you'll at least see a shaded color uh, th that represents whatever that feature is. Now I'm going to zoom into one of the cars here. 
Again, as I zoom in, you will notice it breaks the image down into array of pixels. I, at this stage, if I asked you what this feature is, you couldn't tell me it was a card. Chances are you just think it's a, 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 a array of blocks or a array of, uh, of, of um, uh, individual colors. But as you'll see as I zoom out, your eye plays a trick on you. It starts to merge those together. And at this stage, you could tell me it's a car. You know it's a car because of the context in which it's located. It's in the parking lot. Uh, so it does look like a nice red car here. Um, but when you get in close, obviously, you're starting to see the individual pixels. Um, you're not going to get as much value for that data. Now, because of that, I'm going to introduce you to a component in Global Mapper that you may find to be useful when working with raster data. Uh, obviously, by default, there is no threshold as far as the zoom level extent is concerned. I'm using my uh, mouse wheel now to zoom out on this image. And much like was the case when I zoomed in, when I zoom out, we get to a point where the value of this data is diminished. I'm not able to discern individual features. Obviously, I've only got a small tile here, but even if it was a larger area, the width of that road, the width of the uh, access road into the new building, I can no longer see that. If we were working with vector data, the vector dimensions would be retained regardless of our zoom level. So you, you can still see a road or you can still see a, 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 a point regardless of what zoom level you're looking at. But with rasters, there is a more finite useful range for that data. And if you encounter this issue and you want to limit the zoom level extent, it is an option in Global Mapper. Simply by right clicking, you can choose to set the zoom levels within which each layer will be displayed. And I'm not going to do it right now, but this is the inter this is the dialog box where you can specify the dimensions either based on a size of the file or probably more appropriately within a certain scale range. Um, the scale you will note at the bottom of my screen here. Um, right now at my current view, I'm at about a scale of one to 13,000, almost 1 to 14,000. Um, it doesn't have to be precise, but I could um, define that as my threshold if that was appropriate by simply putting 1 to 14,000 as my upper level view and perhaps 1 to, uh, we'll zoom in a little closer here and find out how far we will uh, uh, be able to travel with this imagery. Uh, again, but until it gets pixelated, we're looking at about a 1 to, about 100 perhaps we could round it to. So again, you could limit the zoom level uh, uh, view uh, zoom level extent of your current uh, display of your raster data. That means you're not going to waste time panning and zooming and redrawing raster data when you're not actually going to use it. And you can apply that to a single file or to multiple files concurrently. Another thing we can look at while we're exploring this sample imagery is the metadata. If you click the metadata tab for the selected layer in the overlay control center, as with any data uh, layer in Global Mapper, it gives you a summary of what's uh, embedded in this layer. And, and scrolling towards the bottom, you can see, as I sort of guessed, the pixel widths and the pixel height. You can see the resolution of the data is included here. Um, we also have information on the projection that was applied. Specifically, we have the EPSG code for this projection. This projection is UTM zone 19, and that is a uh, coded right here. You can actually apply the projection parameters by entering this code. Um, the Confirmation of that is a UTM zone 19, not 83 meters is the projection parameters. Um, you will also see information about the bounding coordinates for this layer. Um, you will see the covered area as well, based on your units of measure. You'll see how much area is covered by this. So essentially, a summary of the contents of this data is available right here in the, uh, meta in the uh, metadata tab. We also can get more details on the projection parameters, uh, as noted here, because it's UTM zone 19. It's given us the uh, central meridian as well as the false easting value which are standardized in UTM. If I choose the Feature Info button in the toolbar, now we have used this extensively when we work with vector data to extract the attribution for a selected feature, uh, whether it be a point, line, or area, if we're working with LiDAR, if, a, if it's part of a point cloud, you can get a, a, a breakdown of all of the attributes. Recently, we introduced the uh, applicability of this tool when working with raster data. So you can click at any point in your raster uh, data, and you can get a breakdown of what it sees at the pixel level. RGB and the alpha band are included in here. You can see that information displayed. Um, you can see, display that as a bar graph, and you can see the uh, uh, relative weight of each of those uh, color values within this specific pixel. You can also view it as a line graph if you want. So just different ways of visualizing that data. You can see the 
specific location of that pixel, uh, row and column dimensions in pixels. So uh, 734 uh, pixels, uh, on, uh, the 734th row of pixel and the 1086th column of pixels defines exactly where that one is. So that's a new application for uh, the um, feature info tool uh, where, as it pertains to working with raster data. Now let's take a look at ex some other examples of raster data. Some of you may have worked with yourself are kind of expanding the extent of raster data beyond just simple aerial imagery such as we're looking at right now. So this is another common example of raster data. This is a USGS map. Uh, those of you who are in the United States may recognize this. This is the standard 1 to 24,000 series, often referred to as the 7.5 minute series maps. Um, this happens to be coverage for the main state capital, just up the road from where I am right now. Um, this is a raster data, raster file, and it shares the characteristics of what we were looking at previously. Zoom in far enough and you start to see individual pixels. In this case, there isn't the array of colors that we encountered when we looked at our aerial imagery. In fact, this is a fairly limited array of colors. Um, again, the zooming out, they merge together so you can start to discern individual features. But there are limited colors on display. We're going to address this in a workflow context a little bit later. This is an example of a raster layer that was derived from a scanned map. Uh, a paper map originally was the source that was scanned and rectified or registered to apply geographic intelligence. We're all going to do that together uh, as part of this presentation. We're going to go through that workflow. How do we do that? How do we transition from just an image, whether it be a scanned image or just a, uh, a raw photograph, and apply geographic, geographic intelligence? We'll do that uh, in, our, in our presentation, but that's how this data was derived. Just an Another example of a raster uh, map, a raster base layer in this case. A variation on that theme is the map you see in front of you again, or another example of a raster layer. This is a, a navigational chart. Um, any of you who are pilots will probably understand this a lot more than I can. Obviously, the symbology that's applied here is most applicable for uh, folks who work uh, in, uh, in aviation. Um, but it is an example of another raster layer. And you can see, um, again, zooming in, zooming out, uh, we start to see the individual pixels that define the, the resolution of this image. This is an example of a satellite image, and specifically this is an example of some data that was downloaded uh, from the USGS Earth, Explorers, or Earth Explorer site. This is Landsat data. Specifically, this file is the red band. Now, it appears as a grayscale image in Global Mapper, but essentially this defines within that collected Landsat satellite imagery only the red band. Now, we are going to use this one a little bit later as well. We're going to apply this data uh, in our raster calculation process because we want to isolate the individual bands in order to perform that calculation. So a satellite image in this case, again, another raster image um, uh, derived from Landsat. Now, chances are you're not getting the full effect of this example uh, without the benefit of having some 3D glasses, the sort of glasses you may put on if you go to a, a 3D movie. This is um, an anaglyph image. Uh, obviously, the individual bands have been offset slightly. This is a, the way it is able to play a trick on your eye with those uh, tinted glasses, the red and blue glasses, I guess. Um, I'm actually wearing some right now, and you'll have to take my word for this, but this image actually appears three-dimensional. As I move my head from side to side, uh, this building appears to, uh, to move with me. I can actually get a three-dimensional context. It's still a standard image. It's still a flat image for all intents and purposes, but because of the way it's been processed, it gives the impression of 3D. Um, this is actually a, a, a city in Holland, and uh, one of the uh, uh, folks I met with in a, at a conference recently, this is the business that they're involved with, is a creation and processing of these 3D images that can be served up through web map services. So just another example of a raster image. Now this final example is fairly familiar to those of you, again, within the US. This is uh, uh, the area of Boston very famous Boston Common here, um, also the Boston Public Garden right in the center of the old part of the city of Boston. This is a raster map, but it looks very much like a vector map. Um, and the reason for that is because this was actually created as a vector map and rasterized. 
Um, this is OpenStreetMap data, another streaming service that's available through Global Mappers, uh, web map services, online data services, um, and it essentially provides a picture view of data that was originally processed in raster f or in vector form. You can access the vector files as well, but this is a rasterized version of a uh, originally a vector file. And proof of that again is if I zoom in, if this was traditional vector data, it would scale based on my zoom level. But as you can see, I'm starting to see the individual pixels in this layer now. So that's these are just some examples of raster data. It's not just imagery, but there's a lot of different variations on the theme of raster data. Now, one of the things that we are often asked is about reprojection. And I think I will address this in the context of raster data. Obviously, whatever the uh, particular data files that you have loaded, same procedure works. If your workflow involves accessing data, accessing imagery, accessing raster data for the purpose of reprojecting it into a, a different system. Global Mapper's reprojection function is initiated from the configuration dialog box. I'm highlighting that button right here in my toolbar. And if I click on that button um, and I go to the projection tab, confirmation here of the current active projection. This is the native projection that was associated with the file that I imported. If I need to reproject, I simply choose the reprojection parameters, the new coordinate reference system information. I want to choose the state plane system in this case. Um, and I will choose not Oklahoma North, that's not going to work for us, but I'll choose the Massachusetts East, uh, the mainland zone actually in Massachusetts. Um, we'll leave the other parameters just as they are for the time being. We'll click OK. And what I've done there is essentially reproject a confirmation of that you'll see along the bottom of the screen. So if your raster processing workflow requires you to uh, take a file and reproject it, I've gone through part of that process. The next phase would simply be an export process because the on-screen projection parameters will be inherited by the file that you export. That's how reprojection works. So in the next section, we're going to talk about some of the kind of image processing um, uh, components of Global Mapper. We're going to uh, look at adjusting some of the characteristics of the raster data. Uh, transparency, for instance, we'll talk a little bit about contrast and, and introduce some other image properties, ability to uh, change the visual characteristics of your raster data. Now, any of the changes that we apply are, are done at the layer level. So I have a simple little tile of some imagery here. And I'm going to click the Options button in the Overlay Control Center. And because this is a raster layer, uh, this array of tabs, this array of parameters, is going to be distinct from what you'll see, or different from what you'll see um, when dealing with vector data. Where when you're dealing with vectors, you're talking about the, the style of the line, you're talking about the label that's applied to the point, things like that. Um, in When working with raster data, Data. Obviously, we're talking about uh, features that are represented by an array of pixels, so the options are going to be different. And you'll notice some of these options here. You can notice a uh, um, simple uh, color intensity adjustment slider. I'm going to apply some of these settings to this sample you see on screen, and we can see the results. Uh, color intensity, if I obviously I make the, the colors darker, we'll just apply that. We don't have to ch change the dialog box. Um, as you'll see, it obviously makes that color uh, a lot more intense. Um, there's a section on, uh, or a, a tab, I should say, for contrast adjustment. Um, you can define more precisely uh, the color balance by sliding the red, green, blue values uh, back and forward, and it's just a percentage value for each. Um, and, and often, if you need to fine tune uh, based on perhaps the initial quality of an image, it's a good idea just to do some trial and error. If I want to increase the relative blue in my image, I'll just simply apply that, and you'll see it gives it a kind of a, a cooler, cooler look when I increase that blue uh, blue value. So again, trial and error as far as uh, these adjustments are concerned. We have contrast adjustments as well. Now, the way that you define contrast is based on a percentage stretch. I want to change this standard deviation value to one. And we'll just apply that. Now, what you'll see as a result of this is that uh, the distinction between the color elements and the color pixels become much more pronounced. In, in many ways, it's easier to distinguish features at this level than it was when the, uh, there was no contrast adjustment applied. I'll look specifically at the uh, trees within the, uh, the little turning circle around about here. If I revert back to the original, you'll see it does look a little uh, washed out. So um, applying that linear uh, uh, contrast adjustment certainly helped. 
Um, some of the other options, um, you can change the transparency. Now for this, I'm going to bring in another uh, data set, another uh, layer in Global Mapper. We're going to look at uh, essentially two different layers concurrently. Now we're dealing with two rasters here, so both are opaque native natively, and we can um, use our image slider, or sorry, my image swipe. I'm sorry, right from my toolbar, as you can see where my cursor is, to pull back one of these layers to see what's underneath. And as you'll see, I have some underlying imagery, and I have a small section of the. Uh, topographic map that we were using earlier sitting right on top. Now if I go back into the options, um, looking at some of the transparency uh, options, I can adjust the overall translucency of whatever the layers. I've just realized I've selected the wrong layer. Let me cancel. I'm going to choose this this topmost layer, the USGS layer. And again, we will adjust the uh, relative translucency. I'll bring that down to about halfway. We'll click apply to see what the end result of this is. And it'll make the uppermost layer semi-transparent so we can see the delineated roads we can see the contours but we can also visualize some of the actual visible features from the aerial image now this is not an ideal solution because in a sense what we're doing here is we're compromising both layers we're washing both out but if there is a need for you to visualize two raster layers concurrently then certainly that is an option let me go back to the opaque again and I'll apply that because in many situations a preferable solution might be to select a specific color to be transparent and as I mentioned previously this layer is a limited palette layer in other words there are very few colors actually displayed we can see greens we can see reds we can see blacks etc um, what I'm going to do in this scenario is to specify a particular color to be completely transparent um, and I can and depending on the type of data I'm using, I can apply a fuzziness value, which essentially will allow me to determine whether a precise color or variations of that color would be acceptable. Because this is a limited palette uh, uh, image, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to choose the green color in this case. And I want to simply select that as my transparent color. We'll click OK and we'll apply that. Now what you'll see as a result of this workflow is that areas that are green are now transparent in the image. And I think it's probably best seen, I'll close the window first, uh, if I zoom in just a little closer, you'll see um, we can still see the contour lines that were from the original scanned map. We can see the, the line work that was, uh, in this case, a, a track. But we can now see the underlying imagery um, where there are now holes, where the green used to be. So a specific application of transparency applied in this case. A slight variation on that theme is to apply what's called a blend. Now I'm going to bring up a, a new instance uh, of Global Mapper and with um, essentially the same top level data but this time if I pull back and reveal what's underneath this time I actually have a terrain layer and I've used the daylight shader as you can see to visualize this terrain layer. Essentially what I've done is remove the default colors that are typically applied to a terrain layer and this is essentially just the hill shader pattern. This, this process will work with any raster data or any combination of two raster layers. In this case it works well even though the underlying layer is actually an elevation layer. Technically it's still a raster layer because what I'm going to do now is run a process to blend the two images together. Where we attempted to adjust the transparency to work with two layers concurrently, it was limited in its success. We weren't able to keep the crispness of the uh, image. We washed out both images essentially. But if we apply a blend, it'll allow us to essentially accentuate one image or accentuate one layer with what's underneath. Now in this case, again, I'm playing with uh, elevation data, and a topographic map. I'm going to blend the two together. That process, again, is right here in the Options dialog box. This time, blend mode. Now, there's a very long list of blend options in here. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, working with graphic files, maybe use Photoshop or some of those graphic applications, will probably be familiar with a lot of these. Um, some of them are fairly complicated in terms of how they're apl applied. The simplest one to define is the multiply one. Because when you multiply the values in a pixel with the values in the pixel that's underneath, you essentially get an accumulation of the values in those two pixels. And so it accentuates, based on what's underneath, the pixel that sits on top. 
Uh, the best way to, to show this or to describe this is actually to show it. So I'm going to click OK after applying a multiply blend. And as you can see, um, the darker areas from my hill shade pattern are now embedded in the image above. It's still two different layers. I can still turn off the imagery layer. That texture will disappear. But we've asked Global Mapper to blend the two together, essentially building a, that multiplied value at every pixel. If I intended this uh, as a final product and I exported this file, it would inherit the characteristics that I've applied here. In other words, it's a what you see is what you get if I need to capture this in an exported file format. So blending is in many ways a much more effective way to work with two raster layers concurrently. Next example I'm going to show um, involves working with Again, two raster layers, but in this case we have a problem because on the left side of my screen we have an image that's a fairly low resolution image, relatively low resolution image, and it seems like it was perhaps taken with uh, maybe different technology, different uh, different uh, light uh, processing. So there's a distinct seam between the two. And if I wanted to, to uh, create an integrated or a combined coverage map using this imagery, well, there's no magic way of, of adjusting. We probably could talk a little bit about some of the contrast uh, adjustments to maybe make them similar, but I'm still going to see this very very well defined line. What I want to show you now is a tool that lets you feather abutting images or overlapping images as the case in this in this example. Again back in the overlay control center I want to choose the high resolution image which is the little tile subset essentially which is sitting on top of some lower resolution data which you can see on the left side of my screen. And if I go to the options um, there is a tab that will allow me to adjust the feathering. If I select that tab it is unfeathered by default but if I click the feathering tab um, I can choose based on this image tile which of the edges to feather and I want to choose all four of them I can also specify the border width in other words how much along the edge of this um, high resolution image is going to be blended use, different uses of the term blended or feathered into the underlying image and I'll start with a hundred pixels uh, trial and error as uh, we said before is sometimes the best approach we'll simply click apply and you will see then that hard seam is no longer there, it's no longer visible. It's quite easy to see that images are still different, but we don't have an abrupt um, transition from one image to the other. And we can extend this, well, I'll extend it out to 200 pixels and apply that and we'll see it again, it extends that feathering so it transitions in a much more gradual way between one image and the other. So we're back to where we started this section. Um, another option uh, that you'll find in the Raster Options dialog box is Color Grade. Now this is a little bit more of a complicated, more involved image processing tool. Um, what you see here is a breakdown of the uh, the, the RGB, the, the three color color bands, red, green, and blue. Um, within each of these bands, you'll see we have an input range slider and an output range slider. This allows Global Mapper to determine what it reads within the file and how it renders uh, those values. So if I adjust the, uh, for instance, the input range, um, I'm going to limit it for my blue color. We'll just apply that. What you'll see on the screen is it really changes the, the characteristics. So you can be very specific on how it reads that channel and how it interprets that channel and ultimately how it displays that channel. This tab also gives you the option to uh, provide a saturation value for the collective colors. And this is going to be on a range of 0 to 1. Um, if I put a 0 in there, what you'll see is my image essentially becomes a grayscale image. Um, so if your intention is to create a grayscale of an image, this is where you will go to do that. Under color grade, you can bypass the manual settings and just set the saturation value to 0. And uh, as you'll see, it creates a grayscale image. So in our next section, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the physical uh, modifications that can be applied to imagery. Specifically, we're going to talk about cropping. Uh, we're going to introduce the idea of tiling imagery. That will be taking a large tile, a large file, I should say, and breaking it into more manageable sizes. That, that can be initiated uh, during the export process, as you will see. 
And as I said at the start, we'll also introduce mosaicing. Now, there's not really a great deal to talk about as far as mosaicing is concerned because it happens automatically. If your workflow requires you to take multiple files, merge them together into a single file, seamless file, just simply export. And by default, Global Mapper will export all of the loaded data in a single file. So cropping, tiling, and mosaicing. So I've loaded up an imagery tile and I'm also going to load up a, a second layer. This is, I'm going to drag and drop from off screen here. This is a shape file and the shape file, if I turn off the imagery, you will see it contains basically a, a boundary file. This is, happens to be a town boundary um, and it's an area, it's a vector area file. Uh, I could also have drawn an area that would also have worked if, if it's appropriate for your workflow. But this is obviously a file that I had already uh, pre-existed. So I'm going to use that tile to limit or constrain the extent of the underlying imagery. I'm going to initiate a cropping process. Um, the way this works is very simple. Um, we simply select that tile. Uh, by the way, you'll notice when I'm selecting a vector feature, out of habit, I draw a box around one of the borders. That That's a useful uh, work workflow in Global Mapper simply because um, if there are multiple features that are likely to be selected, it will focus specifically on the border that you've chosen. So in my case, it really doesn't make any difference. I've only got one feature, but if you had multiple features, perhaps overlapping, you can specify which one to set to select. Now I've got my border selected. I'm going to initiate, initiate the cropping process. Once again, this is back in the options. And this is one of the tabs that we did not look at previously. Choosing cropping gives me various alternatives. I'm going to come back and revisit one of the ones at the top in just a few minutes. I could crop the image manually if I happen to know the specific boundary uh, um, uh, lat long values for the area that I'm interested in. So if you have that noted, you can simply key those in. Um, you can crop by a certain number of pixels around the edge of the layer. In other words, if you want to tidy up maybe a border uh, that, that wasn't processed correctly, you want to just simply remove that to tidy up your image just a little bit. You can specify the number of pixels on either side. Um, I'm going to skip all the way to the bottom. I can crop to a currently selected polygon, which is exactly what I want to do. And I'm going to keep the dialog box open for just a second. If I click Apply, it will, as you will see, limit the visibility of that underlying image to what I had defined in the boundary file. Now, it is worth noting that the image, the sections of this image that are gone are not deleted. We haven't physically removed them. If I want to revert it back to its original form, I simply go back up to no cropping and click apply again and you'll see it's back to the way it was. So cropping to a defined area, very simple process, just initiate the cropping right here in the raster options uh, dialog box. You can also perform the same cropping during export. So if your intention is to export a file, to capture a file, and part of that workflow requires you to limit the extent of what's exported, you don't have to do it here. You can actually do that during the export process. There is a, a export bounds tab that you'll see for every format that you export. And one of the options is to export just what's within the bounds of a selected polygon, as, you, as we have done right here. It's also, it is a good idea to actually visualize the results, just in case. So um, it may be a better uh, uh, workflow to actually initiate the cropping prior to exporting so we can see the results. Now we had this question come in just a few weeks ago. Um, what if I want to crop um, imagery but leave the middle uh, or essentially crop everything but that's what's in the middle. In other words, I want to leave the image around the outside and remove what's inside the town boundary. Well, I don't think in this particular example it probably makes a great deal of sense, but we'll go through that workflow nonetheless. In other words, I want to cut a hole in some imagery aside, as instead of removing what's outside. The workflow for doing that involves one additional step. Um, I'm going to close this dialog box. I'm going to select the imagery tile that I have on my screen, and I'm going to right click that tile uh, on that tile, and I'm going to choose B boxes. This is a tool in Global Mapper that lets you create a bounding box uh, around any layer, vector, raster, or elevation layer, uh, LIDAR, if you're working with LIDAR data, you can create a coverage area, essentially. And you can do it in one of two ways, either as an MBR, which is essentially a rectangular area, or you can simply create a polygon that more precisely outlines the extent of the features that are in that layer, most applicable for raster data or for LIDAR, if you use the no option here. Uh, I'm going to click yes in this case. It'll create a rectangular box. Difficult to see it right now, so I'll have to turn off a couple of additional layers. There we go. Uh, we've now created a bounding box around that image. 
I want to turn on the boundary, the internal boundary as well, because what I'm going to do now is I want to cut a hole in that larger polygon. Um, the way I do that is using the digitizer, I select the internal. Now, this is a place where drawing that bound, that uh, box around the uh, the border is a good idea because now I've just selected the boundary. I right click. We're back in working with vectors now. Very briefly, I go to uh, a crop combine split function, and I'm going to cut the area from another area. I'm going to cut a hole in the outer boundary, and we'll go ahead and choose the outer boundary as our parent in this case. As you can see, the name of the the uh, cursor, and what I like to uh, remove what's uh, in the middle. I'm going to say yes. And now I have a polygon which essentially is the outer extent but not include the middle. That's my hole, my hole, the hole in the polygon. Now if I turn my imagery on again, I'll zoom in just a little bit so we can see the full effect of this. Um, if I, if I um, want to crop my imagery based on a selected polygon and I choose the remaining polygon, Simply right click, or, or sorry, I'm going back in the overlay control center, options, uh, cropping, and now again we crop to the currently selected polygon. Because the polygon is now has now got a hole, it leaves what's outside, removing what's in the middle. And we can turn off the vector features that have already performed their, their task, and now I have imagery in which the center section has been removed. So that's the inverse of the standard cropping process. I want to show a variation on the theme of cropping. Now, for this, we're going to go back and visit one of the layers that we uh, looked at previously. Um, let me actually load it up manually. I'm going to unload this file, and I'm going to load up one of the USGS maps that we looked at previously. I'm just going to drag and drop it out of my screen here, and we'll just choose this example. Now this is again standard USGS map. We looked at this for a couple of scenarios, blending and, and adjusting transparency. One of the things you will notice here is that there's a lot of information around the edge. This is a literally a scanned paper map, so it didn't stop at the neat line of the map. Everything that fall, fell outside was also part of the file that I imported. Although the information below obviously doesn't have any geographic relevance, there's no features here, uh, it is still part of the original map. Now to accentuate the problem that we're having to deal with here, I'm also going to bring in another tile, specifically the one that sits on top. And these two files abut each other, but you'll see already I have a problem here because um, there is an overlapping section that covers what's below, as you can see. So I, in order to create a seamless coverage area, what I would essentially have to do is to crop out everything outside of the neat line. Well, Global Mapper has initiated an automatic tool for addressing that specific issue. And I'm actually going to perform this concurrently on both of these maps. Now, if everything goes according to plan, everything that's um, along this neat line, or the, basically for the uppermost uh, uh, layer, everything that's below the neat line will be removed. And for the layer that's underneath, the one that's to the south, everything that's above the, the top neat line will also be removed. So with my options button selected and my cropping tab selected, I have the option to automatically crop the color. And when we select that and click apply, you'll see it has automatically removed everything outside the neat line and given me a seamless transition from one of those quad sheets or one of these topographic maps to the other. You will notice the formats that that applies to DRG, the digital raster graphics files, the BSB files, if you're working with GeoPDFs, etc. So this is an automated tool that will work with some formats of scanned, registered raster topographic maps. So I've loaded up a series of four imagery tiles, and this is by way of an example of working with multiple data sets. And we can see, as I turn an individual tile off, we can see where that one resides. To address the idea of mosaicing, it is, as I said before, an automated process, not really something we need to go into great depth about, but worth acknowledging nonetheless. If I need to take all four of these image tiles and mosaic them together, to bring them together, um, from the file menu, I simply go to export and I choose image format, choose my selected format, what I need to export the data in, I'll choose JPEG 2000 and click OK. Now, I'm not going to go any further with this process because the process of simply saving the file at this stage will 
um, create a single file for all of the loaded data, whether it's four tiles of imagery or 400 tiles of imagery. They will merge together into a single output file. Um, if you do need to export an individual tile, well, there's a couple of ways of doing that. You can either remove or turn off the ones that you do not need, or you can right click and specifically export that one selected tile. So that is the exception. The default is to export all of the data. So mosaicing in Global Mapper is an automated process. Tiling was the last section of this, uh, last uh, uh, topic of this section. And tiling is also something that can be initiated during the export process. We'll choose the same format, JPEG 2000. The tiling process will work regardless of what data or uh, what format you want to export with. You'll always find a tiling tab in the export uh, options dialog boxes. Tiling allows you to specify the number of rows, number of, uh, number of columns, or you can specify the column width and column height. You can't do both, unfortunately. Well, I guess in many cases you can, but um, in this case, because we're we're exporting our entire data set, I only have one of those two choices that I can apply. I can also specify the pixel size if that's appropriate for what I'm hoping to achieve. Um, whichever method you choose, you, you define the distance, so the, the width and height as it says here. Naming will be applied based on the parameters below. Uh, the default is the A1, A2, B1, B2, etc, etc. Um, and you can define an overlap if it's appropriate. How many pixels or percent um, do you want to overlap with the adjacent tiles? If you do need a certain amount of overlap in your tile coverage, you can specify that right here. So that tiling process, again, if you recall, what I'm looking at on the screen now is actually four different individual tiles of imagery. What I'm doing during the export process now is essentially retiling them. Um, by defining again whatever parameters I want and it's going to tile collectively tile all four of the original tiles into a new set of tiles based on these parameters. I'm not going to go any further forward with that workflow. It's simply a click, it's case of clicking OK. Give the default name. It's just like you would uh, name a single file. It will then append the um, the letter, the numeric, alphanumeric letter sequence that you apply down here at the bottom of the dialog box. So that's the tiling process, essentially the opposite of mosaicing. Now I'm going to show you one more method for tiling that gives you a little more precision over the tiling, the, the mechanism of tiling, and that's through the use of the gridding tool in Global Mapper. You can generate a grid simply by defining an anchor point, either manually by clicking on the map, or you can define the anchor point uh, by specifying the X and Y or lat long values after clicking this button. But thereafter, after doing that, you have the option then to create an array of tiles. If you're looking at a specific area, you can actually constrain the tiles within a rectangle. You'll see I can fill a selected rectangle. Don't, don't have a rectangle right now, so that's not available to me. In other words, I don't have a vector polygon on my screen. So I'm just going to manually define the extent of my tiles. I can define the number of rows, number of columns, and the width and height of each. Now glancing down at my scale bar, I'm looking at about a 50 meter, I'm just obviously doing this arbitrarily, I'm just going to create a 50 meter by 50 meter array of 10 by 10 tiles originating at this anchor point. We'll click OK on that and you will see when my map refreshes, I now have a series of tiles, manually assigned tiles. I can move these, these are just vector tiles, I can tweak them, I can rotate them if necessary, I've got all of the vector editing capabilities that I would have had with, would have with any vector files. But when I'm ready to export, and if, assuming that this now forms the basis of a tiling process, when I go through that export process now, um, I'm again, we'll just choose the defaults here, go to tiling, um, you will have the option to use the selected area feature, or features in this case, for my tiles. So if I ran through this process, I would end up with a hundred small imagery tiles based on this manually created grid that I uh, used the gridding tool in Global Mapper to create. So it's a variation on the theme of tiling. So up to this point, we've been uh, working with and processing and uh, applying settings to pre-existing raster data layers, files that we maybe imported or uh, data that we streamed from one of the web map services. What we're going to do now is take a kind of a step back and address one of the challenges when uh, working with raster data is essentially 
getting data into the application that's non-geographically intelligent. Uh, this may be uh, aerial photographs that were not geo-referenced, or it may be maps that you have scanned, perhaps some old maps that your company has had uh, sitting in that back room that somebody finally scanned. They're now in a digital form, but you'll want to integrate those into your, uh, your spatial databases. And the process for doing that is essentially rectification, the idea of applying intelligence, geographic intelligence, to an image file. So I've just brought up a view of the file that we want to work with here. Uh, you may recognize this as Central Park, New York. Um, I believe this is an early 1900s map. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, the year of this map is, but it's obviously an historic map. Uh, it's just a paper map, essentially, that was digitized, that was scanned. It has no geographic intelligence. What we want to do is overlay this or essentially apply the uh, necessary geographic information to this map that will turn it into a geospatial raster layer. So this is the raw material. I'm going to close this. I want to take a look at what we have to work with in Global Mapper. Now instantly you'll notice that the alignment of the same geographic area is different. Um, that picture that we looked at was aligned well East, I was going to say east and west. It's actually just right and left as far as the image is concerned. But Central Park, this is the area of uh, um, Manhattan, it does not run east and west. It's running kind of in a northeast southwest direction. So as part of this rectification process, we're going to apply that uh, angle deviation, if you like, as well as scaling the image so it fits nicely in place. This data is the uh, open street map data that I downloaded. This is a raster tile of the same data that I previewed uh, towards the start of our session. We're going to use this as the foundation for the rectification process. In other words, we're going to identify specific locations in this base map and tie them in to the image that we're importing to apply the rectification process. Now before we begin this, an alternative method for me performing this type of procedure would be to physically go into the field and and collect those X and Y values at a known location. Again, a location I may be able to recognize in the image that I'm trying to rectify. Uh, by applying the manual coordinates, you can be more specific. Obviously, uh, if you go to a particular location, uh, a control point in the field, using some uh, high-end GPS data collection tools, uh, you can be very specific on, on the allocation of that ground control point. What we're doing here is going to be essentially um, identifying those points on a pre-existing layer. And we're making an assumption that whoever created this data did so with a reasonable amount of accuracy. That may not be the case. But in the purpose, for the purpose of what we're doing today, I think this will be sufficient. So when we work with non-geospatial data, there's a couple of ways that we can get it into the application. Um, there is from the file menu a dedicated rectify georeference geo imagery uh, option, which allows you to point to any of the supported raster formats. Alternatively, you can simply just go to the open data file button, uh, or option rather, and browse to the necessary file. Now, I'm going to go to my desktop. I'm going to locate that file. This is one of our training files. So I'm just going to browse into the folders that we use and this is the file that I had previewed just a few minutes ago. This is our Central Park file. The adjacent file is the one that we're using for reference. So we're going to bring in this simple JPEG file. Now when we browse to that file, Global Mapper recognizes that there's no geographic information, so it asks me what I want to do. First option is to manually rectify, which we are going to do. Second option is to fake the coordinates. Now that, what that'll do is essentially place that image at zero degrees latitude, latitude zero degrees longitude, allowing me at least to uh, to begin the process of working uh, with that file. I, I may then recognize, oh, this is in New York, so I can initiate a rectification process after uh, initially uh, visualizing the image. The third option is to load as a picture point. Essentially, this will create a hyperlink to the file at a point that I designate uh, on the map. So it's uh, similar to importing a, a photograph that you may take with your GPS-enabled smartphone. It creates a link to where uh, that photograph was taken. Again, our option in this case is right here at the top, manually rectify image. And it will immediately load up the rectify, image rectifier dialog box. On the left side is a, a, a view of the original superimposed on which is this grid. The function of that you'll see in just a few minutes. In the middle is a zoomable view of the same image. This is what we're actually going to work with to identify our control points. And over here on the right side 
is the view of my current map and when I left the map view this is the area that I was looking at this allows us to browse around and look for areas or look for locations that are recognizable in both we're going to tie the two together towards the bottom of this window you'll see uh, areas for entering the ground control points these are the pixel locations for places that I identify in the image um, the corresponding easting or uh, nor or X values or longitude or Y values northern or latitude can be entered here you can enter these manually you can manually define these values we're going to do this in an automated way as you will see and then we have a tabular view that will convey for us all of the uh, control points that were used and we'll see those listed here as we go through this process each of these views is a, you can interact you can zoom I'm just going to zoom into the corner here and you'll see I can now get a close-up view of I think what is not called Columbus Circle right here in the uh, um, uh, southwest corner of Central Park and you'll notice now on my uh, adjacent view that grid is now constrained to the area that I'm currently looking at. This is a way to navigate around very efficiently. I can simply click to go to another location in the image. So that's the function of the window on the left hand side. I'll zoom in just a little closer so we can get a close up view of the circle as it's called. And I'll look at the same location in the existing layer. Now it is a slightly different configuration, but I'm going to make an assumption if I click close to the center of the circle, simply click with my left mouse button, you'll see a little red dot appears. And don't worry about misplacing that dot. You can click again, it will simply replace it in a new location. But again, clicking close to the center of that circle, that location corresponds with the same center location over here on the pre-rectified, already geographically intelligent map. Having clicked on both of those locations, one in the uh, uh, JPEG and one in the pre-existing uh, layer, you will notice that the pixel and coordinate values have now been populated based on where I clicked. Assuming I'm happy with that, I can add that to my list of control points. Give it a name, we'll leave it as control point one, point one, which is perfectly fine, and click OK. So we have our first point added. We could get away with just two. There are There is a rectification method that will allow you simply to define two points as far apart as possible, and that will allow you to adjust the scale and the rotation to hopefully align the, the, the map fairly accurately. Um, I'm going to actually choose four different points. I'm going to move uh, my position over here to the uh, opposite corner, the, uh, the north corner, I guess. I'm going to do the same on the uh, registered map. I'll pan just a little bit, and I'll zoom in a little closer here. And I'm seeing, again, a slightly different road configuration. Let me choose what I would approximate to be the center of where that circle is. And again, we'll click at the center right here as well and again add that point to my list. I'm not going to do this with any great level of accuracy today just in the interest of time. We'll move to the adjacent corner. I'll zoom out once again and we'll zoom in and again we have a circle here which doesn't exist in the early part of the uh, 20th century so we'll click at approximately where that center of the circle would be and once again over here and if we were doing this properly we probably would choose an adjacent road intersection as an alternative. Uh, we'll zoom out one more time zoom over to the final corner and scroll down a little bit so we can see a little more clearly and again the road configuration is so completely different now but we'll assume in the center view that that road intersection right here that looks like East 59th Street right here it corresponds with uh, I think I zoomed in a little too, too far right here this intersection and again, oh, I forgot to add the point last time. Let's, we'll have to go back and add our, our third point here. Once again, my apologies. We will add that final point. That's always a, a, a step that you need to make sure you do. Once you've added your point, add that point to the list. A little out of order, but that shouldn't make a difference. So I've got four control points. You can see them now in the larger map view. You can see them in each of the individual map views. We can simply click OK at this stage and it will apply those control points to the image and hopefully it will give us a rectified, aligned version of that layer. So we now have our image geographically referenced and we can look at the quality of the rectification process. There's a couple of methods we could employ um, to zoomed into uh, some of the streets here on the, uh, 
I guess that would be the uh, east side of Central Park. And using the image swipe tool, which we looked at earlier, we can now pull back the overlying image to see how well it lines with what's underneath. And just a cursory glance confirms it's a reasonably good alignment here. You can see the streets lining up reasonably well. We can also look at the transparency option that we had uh, looked at before and temporarily adjust the opacity of the Central Park layer. I'll just leave this window open and click the Apply button. And again, we can see some of the underlying detail from the OpenStreetMap data, as well as the historic map sitting on top. So using these two methods, we can verify how accurate our registration was. And if necessary, we can then modify the rectification parameters if we need. Add additional points, remove perhaps points that are causing error. We have options for changing that. And the way that you can do that, I'll just go back to the op opaque version again, is to simply right click on the layer and choose rectify. Now this can be done with any layer. Obviously this is a layer that was pre-rectified, but if I need to, I can check an existing layer and override the inherent geographic parameters and essentially manually place that if I need to. In this case, obviously, it makes more sense because this is a layer that I had manually rectified, so it's likely that I would, on occasion, need to change those uh, rectification parameters. Before you embark on that process, by the way, I should uh, mention, it is a good idea um, to actually physically turn the layer off before you re-rectify it. Now the reason for that will become clear when I select the rectification option because on the right side of my screen you'll see the reference map is the original OpenStreetMap. Um, if I had left the registered version displayed it would also be displayed over here so it would make the rectification process extremely difficult. I would be looking at the same data that I wanted to rectify as a base map for rectification. So obviously turning it off gives me the view of the original map and if necessary I can take points and delete them. I can modify them, double click on a point, it brings it up into the ground control point uh, uh, area, ch change it if necessary, add a new point if necessary. So I've got complete editing capability over that rectification process. And as I mentioned previously, I'll cancel the re-rectification. If my workflow required me then to uh, take that base image, uh, generate a geospatial version of that file and ultimately export that, I can simply go to the file menu and run that export process to any standard raster format. Now this next workflow is an extremely useful one and I mentioned at the start that this is one of the uh, tools in Global Mapper which is not immediately apparent. Uh, there's a little bit of searching that has to be done to find this function but once you've uh, uncovered it um, you will find a lot of value in what this does. Um, we are going to employ a process. We're going to transition or going to take data in a raster format and generate vectors from that. We're going to gen generate vector features. Um, I like to call this process a vectorization process. Now the source data you see on your screen is some standard aerial imagery. This happens to be uh, an area in the Canadian Rockies and you can see quite clearly in the middle of the screen is a body of water, a lake, actually a couple of different bodies of water. Um, we'll, we'll use the scenario uh, for this workflow that we did want to determine the area of those lakes, how much water coverage is in those lakes. And obviously when you're interacting with raster data, that's a little bit uh, difficult because in order to determine that we may have to trace the boundary manually and we're not sure how accurate that would be. So what we're going to do is extract the lake area or lake areas as vector features. Now this component of Global Mapper is initiated from the Overlay Control Center and it's done so by right clicking on the layer in question. I have the JPEG 2000 layer here. I right click and I create area features from equal values in selected layer. Now values in this context refers to colors. We can also employ this tool for extracting areas of equal elevation or indeed of equal slope angle. Slightly different context. We have covered these uh, scenarios in previous online presentations and, and webinars. So if you want to find more information about working with terrain data in this context, you can refer to one of those. In this context, we're specifically going to be looking at matching colors to create vector features. So when I select this option, it prompts me to uh, define the parameters for the vector layer that I'm going to create. I can first give it a name. As you can see, it inherits the name from the underlying layer. I'm just going to 
remove the suffix. This is going to be called layer, lake areas is the name of our vector layer. We're not concerned about the specific attribute that we're going to add to the vector features in this layer because they're essentially all going to be the same. We're going to match the colors that uh, only the colors that fall within this lake so they will all fall within a certain uh, 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 RGB threshold if you like. Um, we can define the, the feature type. I'm not going to worry about that in this context either. Um, what I want to do is to specify the specific colors that we are going to extract. We're not concerned about extracting all pixels or all colors. Rather what we want to do is only create areas for the selected colors. And the selected colors, I have them in my recent list here, um, defined by RGB values, which by the way you can see at the bottom of the uh, screen screen here over on the bottom left corner of my screen you can see the RGB where my cursor is located so um, if I had moved my cursor over the lake it would have shown me what the RGBs are and I would have transposed those into this uh, uh, dialog box which I've already done and selected this color now if I went with just the selected color and, and run the extraction process it would give me a handful of pixels maybe I don't know several dozen pixels maybe a few more uh, that specifically match that color what we want to do is extend that threshold um, beyond just that color and we put in a value here to achieve that that can be up to 256 if we choose 256 that would basically imply that all of the colors in this in this uh, layer will be extracted um, a value of, uh, of uh, zero would be just the specific color so we're going to um, move that the scale just a little bit we're going to uh, put a threshold value of 20 in here and often when you're going through this workflow trial and error is the best approach um, if you put in a value and you're not quite getting the colors you expect you can come back in and expand that threshold just a little bit but the end result of this will be we're going to match colors which were defined by that RGB value um, and 20, a scale of 20 above and below, 20 out of 256 above and below that selected color. And the final thing I'm going to do is to limit the extent of this analysis. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to draw a box manually around the extent of these bodies of water. And I'm going to ask Global Mapper just to look inside that area. I'm not interested in anything beyond the bounds of that box. And we'll click OK. And when this dialog or this status bar um, uh, completes, you'll notice I have vector features on my map. In fact, I have over 7,000 vector features. Well, I get, we're deviating a little bit from raster processing, but we might as well finish this workflow, even though we're dealing with vectors now. Obviously, there's uh, polygons in here which I don't need. Those that are in the forested area match the color threshold I had applied, so I need to remove those. Now, the easiest way to do that, using your digitizer, right-click, go to Advanced Selection Options, and you can choose to select areas or islands, holes essentially, that are smaller than a specific size or a selected size. And just again from the trial and error process, having gone through this before, I'm going to leave the two, 930 square meters as my threshold. Anything larger than that, that size will be retained. Anything smaller than that size will be deleted or will be selected, I should say. And ultimately, when I hit the delete button, will be deleted. So we'll click OK, asking me if I want to only select the islands. I'm going to say no. You can see now they're selected. What you can't see is me hitting the delete key on my keyboard and I now have removed all but three of these vector features. So I was able very quickly, very easily to extract based on a matching color um, areas that are recognizable in an image. And if I did continue the workflow to the next level, I would be able to determine the specific dimension based on the measurements that are associated with these vector polygons. In this next workflow, we're going to take some satellite imagery, specifically some Landsat imagery uh, that is divided into its individual bands. And we're going to take two specific bands, the red band and the near-infrared band from our, our, our Landsat data, and we're going to perform a calculation. The overlapping pixels, with pixels sitting on top of other pixels, are going to be the basis of this calculation, and we're going to perform a numeric calculation to determine um, uh, a, a 
quantifiable value and ultimately to build a gridded surface, a gridded model um, that defines uh, the, the, the uh, calculation between those two uh, pixels. Specifically in this scenario, we're going to calculate the Naturalized Dif Difference Vegetation Index, NDVI. This is a gauge or a measure of the relative greenness of an, uh, of an area. Um, and you'll see as we apply this calculation, it tells us where vegetation is most green and we could uh, assume where the vegetation is healthiest. We're actually going to perform this analysis twice, once for a, a June time frame and once for September. And we're going to determine, based on a comparison and a calculation, the difference between the greenness within both of those time frames. On the screen, you'll see um, one of the bands, essentially uh, one of the uh, uh, Landsat bands, and if you look at my overlay control center, this one is June, and because this layer is on the bottom, the near infrared band is on the bottom, this is the near infrared ch uh, channel uh, for June. I'm going to use my image swipe tool and pull that back, and we'll see then the red band for June, the second to bottom uh, item in my overlay control center. So the overlapping area, there's exactly the same area, but the overlapping pixels within each of these two images are going to be the basis of the calculation. We're going to repeat the, the process in just a little bit for the September um, uh, month as well. Um, from the analysis menu, the raster calculation process is an item right here towards the bottom, where we apply a formula to l any loaded data. Now, the pre-selected options in my overlay control center are carried over, so I'll just retain those. We'll click OK, and gives us the uh, formula creation dialog box where I'm going to ultimately create a new raster layer, a gridded layer that's going to be based on the calculated value for each pixel. So the first thing I'm prompted to do is to give the layer a name. I'm just going to call this one June. It is the NDVI. We'll remember that, but it is June's layer. So when we see it in an overlay control center, we'll know it's the NDVI calculated for June. There are a number of pre-defined um, formulas that can be chosen from here in the uh, this dialog box. You can also, by the way, at a custom formula. If you want to define the custody parameters for your calculation based on manual input, you certainly have that option. But I've got a NDVI pre-formulated. I'm going to select that. I'm going to add that band right down below. And you'll notice the NDVI formula is band 4 minus band 1 divided by band 4 plus band 1. Now this is actually derived from Landsat 7, uh, older generation of the Landsat data where band 4 was the near infrared band, band 1 was the red band, and the, as you'll see in just a second, the designation of those bands has changed uh, with Landsat 8. So we actually need to manually assign the appropriate layers that we have in our overlay control center to represent the, uh, the bands as indicated in the formula here. Um, this will be uh, a gridded layer, so we're going to use a shader to represent the results. And the NDVI shader is, at, is uh, available now in Global Mapper. It was a fairly new addition, um, and it will be selected by default. So when this process runs, we will actually see the data rendered with that NDVI shader. Um, we'll click OK on this, uh, with this dialog box, having added the uh, formula. Um, this is where we associate the individual layers that we have in our overlay control center with the bands as per the calculation. Well, as I said, band one um, is in the formula, it represents the red band. Even though it's band four with the Landsat 8 data, it is technically band one as far as the formula is concerned. So I just have to make that association. Um, Consequently, band 4 in the formula is band 5 now, which is the near-infrared band. So that's really all I have to do in this dialog box. Run the calculation by clicking OK, and it will show me the uh, index of relative greenness, the NDVI index. And you'll notice on the left side of my screen, the NDVI shader indicating shades from blue through green indicating greenness. Now blue would be is uh, typically water. Areas that are white would typically be impermeable surfaces like, like uh, pavement. And then obviously increasing values of green uh, are represented uh, as uh, vegetation or, or vegetation areas uh, on our map. Now I'm going, going to quickly repeat the process using the September uh, map. So I'm going to turn off the gridded surface I just created. I'm going to repeat the NDVI calculation uh, using September's layers. Exactly the same procedure. It's pre-selected here because I changed the selection in the overlay control center. Click OK. Uh, we'll call this one SEPT for abbreviating September. Add our NDVI once again. 
and it populates this little dialog box with a confirmation of the calculation. Once again, assigning band uh, our, our band 4 layer to the band 1 in the calculation and band 5 to band 4 in the calculation and once again clicking OK runs through the calculation of the overlapping uh, uh, pixels and gives us a September layer. Now I'm going to turn off the original Landsat and we'll focus specifically on these two gridded surfaces. I'm going to zoom in just a little closer here so we can start to see a little more detail. Um, first thing to note if we use our image swipe tool with September's layer, I'm sorry, let's do that again, let's do, turn September on. With September's layer visible on top, if I pull back, you'll notice in certain areas in June there was a heightened level of greenness. Specifically over here on the left side, you'll see there were areas that were significantly greener in June than in September, and that would be fairly typical in this area. I believe this is in Colorado, where uh, post winter, early spring, or late spring, I guess it would be in June, there is a lot more moisture, a lot more greenness uh, from that. That uh, pre-summer uh, vegetation pattern. After the summer in September through the end of the summer you'll notice the, uh, the relative greenness in this area has diminished. However, you will notice there are certain areas in this agricultural area that actually have more greenness. They're not cultivated. Right where my cursor is located in the middle of the screen you'll see one of these concentric uh, um, irrigated areas which is a lot greener in September than it was in June and the reason for that is obviously it, it was irrigated over the summer. We can actually model that difference by performing an additional calculation. And that's done from the analysis menu. We could go back and actually formulate this under raster calculator again, but this is actually pre-configured under the combine compare terrain layers option. Um, this is a, a tool which is more commonly applied when working with elevation data, but because we're working with essentially similarly gridded data, we can apply a calculation in this context. Now I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm going to choose September and I'm going to subtract June. I'm using the subtraction operation here. There's a lot of different operations can be applied here. These are pre-configured uh, uh, calculations applied to two um, gridded layers. Considering this in the context of uh, elevation data, you can see you can define the maximum between the two, the minimum or the average between the two overlay overlapping layers. In my case, I want a, a subtraction where I maintain whether it's signed, and it's going to create a combined elevation grid. I might want to rename that if I took the time to do that. Uh, and DVI difference might be an appropriate name. We'll just click OK, and we will generate a new gridded layer. And I'm going to turn off the other layers. It actually has applied my daylight shader by default, probably not the best choice. I want to choose the gradient shader in this case. This is probably the best one. This shows me, um, you can note on the scale, areas which have seen an increase um, in their relative greenness. Those are the lighter colors towards the top. And those areas which have seen a relative decrease, with the middle point being right, right in the middle here. You may want to develop your own shader for this purpose, where it creates a very distinct cutoff between those below zero and those above zero. But quite clearly now I can see significant areas within this cultivated land which are greener in September than they were earlier in the year. Areas in the more natural habitat in the forested areas are slightly darker than they were. In other words, the value is slightly below zero, so they are less green than they were earlier in the year. So that Initial analysis was based on a calculation of the multiband Landsat imagery and then the comparative analysis by simply subtracting one from the other to get a visualization of uh, relative greenness over there over two different seasons. As you can see, my final, final bullet here is best practices. Uh, it's almost like I want to give some advice. You know, working with raster data, what would you suggest I do when I work with my raster data? I'm going to introduce a couple of workflow optimization options, um, even within the context of, global, of uh, working in your overlay control center. We'll talk about grouping data. Um, we'll introduce the idea of a map catalog for working with uh, uh, raster data, specifically large volumes of raster data. Um, we'll introduce the batch processing tool. Um, a lot of people who have been using Global Mapper for a while have, no, have never encountered this. I mean, it's interesting, I was talking to somebody recently who wasn't aware of the fact that batch processing was an available option. I'll also talk in theory about scripting. I'm not actually going to take the time to, to, to develop any scripts, but introduce the idea of being able to automate workflow through the creation of a script. And as I mentioned at the start of our session, if you're interested in scripting, there is a, a recorded presentation that we did, we've actually done it several times, which introduces the scripting process and you can refer to that uh, to expand on the on the scripting process. 
So in order to illustrate some of these uh, workflow optimization options, I've brought in the same four image retiles that we looked at previously. This is just as a uh, used as a hypothetical example for working with multiple uh, data tiles, multiple image retiles. Needless to say, the procedures I show you here could equally well and perhaps more appropriately be applied when you're dealing with significantly larger volumes of data. For the purpose of illustration, I'm just using four tiles in this case. As you can see, all four tiles are, are visible. All four tiles are turned on. Um, and I have four line items in my overlay control center, each of which allow me to turn the tile on, to individually apply certain parameters or settings, go to the options, etc., etc. So they are, for all intents and purposes, standalone individual layers in Global Mapper. What I want to show you first is a very simple tool for simplifying and cleaning up your overlay control center and that's through a process called grouping. With all of the uh, uh, selected layers selected, all of the uh, loaded layers selected I should say, I right click and I choose group. Now grouping is a very simple procedure where I simply type a name. I'm going to type the word Augusta, that's the coverage area here, and simply click OK. You will notice in the Overlay Control Center, what was previously four items is now one item um, called Augusta. And you will also notice that there's a little plus sign right next to it. And if I uh, click the plus sign, I have the individual tiles still visible here, which if necessary, I can collapse. And if necessary, I can apply options or settings to the group by simply initiating the same procedure I would have done for each individual layer. So collectively now I can change transparency, feathering, any of the other options that I had uh, previously looked at. I also, if necessary, have individual control over specific tiles. So I still have you know, layer level control, but I can simplify and improve my workflow by collapsing the group into one line item. So obviously if you've got hundreds and hundreds of image retiles, you do not want to have to be scrolling through the overlay control center um, in order to perform any processes or to find additional data that may be in there somewhere. Collapsing these into groups is a, a very, very uh, efficient uh, process as far as uh, managing multiple files is concerned. Now groups can obviously be applied beyond this context. Uh, you can apply a, a grouping to a group of layers, maybe of different data types that pertain to a particular project or job site. Um, they do not have to have anything in common, in other words, as far as the structure of the files or the file format is concerned. But it is very common to apply grouping in this type of situation. Removing a file from a group is equally simple. I'm going to take this last tile, I'm going to right click and you'll notice group is still available here. Selecting that confirms the name for me. Simply deleting that name and clicking OK will relegate that individual tile to be a standard item in the overlay control center outside of the group. So removing the name essentially controls the group. And for that matter, if we choose all of the remaining tiles, and again, simply remove the name, it removes the group completely. So grouping, very simple tool for managing data. The next level up as far as data management is concerned is to create what's called a global mapper catalog. And I can do that either as an external process where I build the catalog prior to loading data, or as you can see, I've got some data loaded. So I'm going to initiate that process from these four tiles that I have on my map. With them all selected, I'm going to right click. I'm going to choose a create map catalog from selected layers. A map catalog is a data management function of Global Mapper that allows you to create a single file. You load a single file into Global Mapper that ultimately uh, or uh, consequently will point to many source files. So in this case, again, there's only four tiles to begin with, but it could equally well apply to hundreds and hundreds of files. I create the catalog. It first prompts me to give it a name. I'm going to give it a name called test. I'm going to drop it right on my desktop and we'll click OK or save in this case. Um, it has saved the catalog. It has automatically added the tiles that are currently in my workspace to this catalog. And you can see the path defined here from you know where my data currently resides. A um, couple of things here. I can add additional data, either individually or based on what's within a defined directory. I can remove individual tiles as necessary. So I've got a, a management tool that lets me determine what's part of this specific catalog. I also have the option to go into the modify options like we did before with individual layers to change, again, things like the band setup, projection cropping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, once I'm done, um, I click OK. And I'm going to unload this data individual tiles 
Control U is the keyboard shortcut, by the way. And I'm going to load up that catalog. It should be somewhere on my desktop. And it's right here, called Test. Now, as a consequence, the same maps are being displayed, the same four tiles are being displayed. You may have noticed they came in a lot faster. And a single line item is now displayed in my overlay control center. This line item um, is something that Global Mapper manages as an individual entity, as opposed to managing four, ten, 100 different individual tiles. So Global Mapper's processing is much, much more efficient because it sees a single file as opposed to multiple files. If I need to change any of the parameters on my catalog, I can go to Options and I go back into this dialog box and I can change uh, any of these settings as needed. Um, if I need to remove an item from the catalog, I simply remove it, change the raster uh, characteristics or the vector characteristics if that's applicable. You can do that uh, right here with this button. So Map Catalogs. Um, Managing data collectively, all of the uh, imagery tiles that you have for a certain area can be defined as one individual file as far as Global Mapper is concerned. And it certainly improves efficiency as well as usability within the application. You're simply loading one file, removing one file as needed. Now the final thing we're going to show um, is a tool for batch processing. I'm going to leave the current data on the screen right now because in truth, it really doesn't matter. The batch processing tool is actually an external function of Global Mapper. You're not actually dealing with data that's loaded on the screen. This is initiated from the file menu. And you'll see about halfway down, just a little more than halfway down, the batch convert and also reprojection, by the way, is another option in here. Allows you to take um, whatever files in whatever format um, define the conversion parameters and then immediately export those without actually having to load them into the application itself. So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to take the JPEG 2000 files that we've been playing with, these four tiles, the original four tiles, I'm just going to scroll through and find JPEG 2000 and let's export them or transform them or convert them, I should say, into ECW files and we'll click OK. Now, once I've defined the input format and output format, I now have the option to add all of the data and I can do that either on an individual level or on a directory level either way it will work in my case um, I'm going to go to uh, my webcast data folder and here are the four tiles that we've been playing with we'll just go ahead and add them uh, to this list and again they do not have to be loaded into Global Mapper this is independent of any loaded data um, the output directory the destination I can specify the file name I can specify either uh, it can be exactly the same as the uh, file name or I can append or, or append uh, a text string um, I can define the projection parameters by default it's using the same projection that was used for import but I can change that in fact if all that I want to do is reproject but maintain the same format I can choose the JPEG 2000 in and JPEG 2000 out during those first two initial dialog boxes and just simply change the projection parameters and it will run through that process. There are options that are specific to individual formats as far as how the procedure works but once you have all these settings applied it's simply a case of, click, a case of clicking OK and it will run through that export, uh, that transformation conversion process for you. Um, I've only got four tiles here, so it should not take too long to run through. Uh, you can see the status bars there running through and um, essentially batch processing uh, my data. Now, while this is uh, chugging along, um, let me also talk briefly about scripting. Um, again, with apologies, not something we're going to go into in any depth with this uh, particular presentation, but uh, there is other, uh, other resources that are available to you, and, and there's also an online reference. Global Mapter scripting allows you to automate workflow um, by essentially defining the, a series of commands, and based on those commands, a series of parameters or settings um, in a simple text format. So I like to tell people, if you can type, if you can uh, type uh, uh, words in a notepad file, you're well qualified to creating a global mapper text. In fact, the structure of a workspace, which is the fundamental file management component of global mapper, is identical to a global mapper script. So you can actually base your scripting uh, procedures on workspaces that you actually save within the application. So again, not going to go any further with that today, um, but scripting is an option to 
uh, automate a lot of workflow, standard raster data processing, uh, conversion, reprojection, cropping, tiling, all of those procedures can be automated in our, uh, in our scripting process. It looks like I'm just about to the last of my converted uh, tiles going from JPEG 2000s to, uh, uh, to uh, the uh, ECW files. And I'll just off screen here. Uh, I'm not even sure what directory I was writing them to, so uh, we'll assume that it looks like it's been written into a, a temp folder here. So um, let's go ahead and notice our time is just about up. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. We'll go back and uh, uh, bring up the contact information I referred to earlier. Um, um, as with all of our webinars, all of our presentations, uh, and we have uh, continued help. If you have questions on any of the topics that you see in this recorded version or, or any of the previous recorded sessions, um, the geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com email is where you can go. I'll put that link in our YouTube description so you can go there directly. If you're looking at this on our website, um, you can... Uh, um, Go to our support menu at the top of the screen and you'll find your way to our help area and there's a, a, a submission form there that you can access the folks in our help menu, our, our help se our department. It will essentially send an email to the same inbox. The Global Mapper Forum I referenced earlier as well. If you're not currently using the forum, if you're not a, a forum participant, I strongly encourage you to get involved. Great active community of users. Post your questions, answer other people's questions if uh, you feel so qualified. Uh, GlobalMapperForum.com. And of course, there's our email address if you're not currently using Global Mapper and you're maybe interested in some of the tools that we cover today as well as perhaps other uh, the content of other we uh, webinars and webcasts that we've done in the past you can download a copy uh, go to the Global Mapper menu and you'll be offered the option to download uh, the application you can request a two-week free trial and uh, put it through its paces so and that is that for today I thank you for taking the time to, to watch the presentation and we look forward to speaking to you next time thank you